Okay. Blake? You have to look at yourself and reflect on how you've changed through suffering. Okay. The short answer is you need to know everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of these things might give you some hints, but to really know why you're suffering, you have to know everything. Do you know everything? Oh, come on, guys. You're Bible school students. You must know everything. No, of course we don't. We don't know everything. But we know the one who knows everything. And that's where we have to go with our, our questions. And then when we, we get maybe partway answered, and we leave the rest with him. So there's only one God. And news, news flash, you are not that God. The first temptation was from the Satan in the form of a snake that you can be God. You can decide what's right and what's wrong. But uh, that was a lie. And I had this conversation earlier with, uh, with Cooper. The most controversial verse in the Bible is in the beginning God. Because if God is in the beginning and we're not, who are we responsible to? We're responsible to our creator. And we have to answer to him. And you don't know everything. I don't know everything. We are not God. And even if we knew everything, that still doesn't make us God. So um, God issues a challenge, and he says, um, what are you going to answer to me? Who are you gonna, how are you going to argue with me? You're a fault finder. And then jo Job, and here is where we have the measure of Job. Look how he answers in verse um, 3 through 5. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. That's sort of poetic language to say, I've done a lot of talking, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut now. Um, what does that tell you about Job? as a person, as character traits. Humble. <coughs> Humble. Who said that? OK. Trent? There's a lot of self-control. Self-controlled. Self-controlled. OK. He learns quick. He learns quick. Yeah. He, uh, he fears the Lord. Yeah. I mean, that's really, all of those things are true, but that's really the foundation. He fears the Lord, even after all of this. So his heart apparently has been right with God all the time. Despite all the stuff that he's been spouting out, he's been doing it on the foundation of a relationship with the Lord. And that is why God will later say what he has said is correct. Not that everything he said was correct, but the fact that he said it was right. Um, Job apparently did not have any secret, unrepented sins like his friends accused him of having. He had his integrity. But he had now committed sin in how he had found fault in God. And God, I think gently but firmly, chides him and says, you fault finder, let's talk now. Um, And it's quite sobering for us to realize that in dealing with Job, who had lost everything, his family, his home, his wealth, his children, his health, God basically tells him, I haven't made any mistake. I know what I'm doing in creation. I just took you on a tour of it. I have things in control. And in your private world, I haven't done anything wrong. And I wouldn't have changed one detail. Wow, how can God say that? Because he knows everything and we don't. That's one of the things. Okay? Um, and it causes us to ask, how do we respond to criticism?
And remember, maybe God may not be speaking to us directly like he did to Job, but he's speaking to us through his word. He's speaking to us through his Holy Spirit. He's speaking to us through the community of believers. Maybe even our parents, you think? How do we respond to just criticism? Job put his hand over his mouth because he knew that his mouth was the instrument of his sin. Let me just give you an illustration from my own life about how we can come to conclusions before we know everything. And I still don't know everything. I spent um, the formative years of my life in a French school in Monte Carlo. I was in 11th grade when my father uh, told us as a family, we are moving back to the United States. I had no desire to move back to the States. France was my home. And I said, well, you can go, but I'm staying here. I'm going to finish school here. 11th, 11th grade. Well, my father won the battle, and we moved back. And we moved to New Jersey, of all places. Anybody ever lived in New Jersey? OK. Concrete jungle. And it was the worst year of my life. You come in as a senior in high school. And because I'd been in French school, I had way more credits than I needed to graduate already. But I didn't have US history. And I think that was it. And so I had to spend a whole year in an American high school just to get those credits because they wouldn't give me a, a diploma without US history, whatever. Um, they treated me, they bullied me. They, I came from France, so I was a frog. And I was you know, weird, I wasn't like them. And uh, they made fun of me and it was awful. I had friends back at the school where I had been and now I have no friends except one. He was the son of the pastor of the church that we attended. And he happened to be um, an all-state fullback on, the, on the, um, uh, their football team. But he's very shy, quiet, uh, except on the football field. And they made fun of him, too, for being a Christian. In France, they didn't even care what you wear. You know? But here, all of a sudden, oh, you're a Christian. OK, let's make fun of you. And it was awful. In fact, I never even attended my graduation. You know, I, they, they wrote in the yearbook uh, that I never bought uh, the pro my class prophecy. I wasn't going to become president of the United States. I was going to start a French dial a prayer ministry in the local area. Well, you may not even know what that means, but you used to you know, dial a phone. And so you could dial a number, and somebody would pray for you. Well, just to make fun of me, is I'm going to start a dial a prayer, a ministry in French. So somebody in America calls and says, I want somebody to pray for me in French. You know, That was my class prophecy. Um, on top of that, I had a teacher. His name was Joe Pecorero. He was my physics teacher. And Norm, my friend, and I sat way in the back of the class. And that teacher bullied us the whole year. He made fun of us. And he called us names for being Christians whenever he would talk about anything scientific. Well, of course, we have those two Bible thumpers out in the back row there who don't believe any of this stuff. You know, They, they believe all these legends from, from the Bible and, and blah, blah, blah. I didn't think that was legal here in America. I thought teachers were supposed to treat you with respect. Well, not him, not Joe Pecorero. So anyway, I survived that year. Um, 10 years later, Christina and I were married by that time. And we came back to that town because the church where I attended, they had become our supporters, monthly supporters for our missionary work. And um, they had a missionary conference. And we were you know, browsing and talking to different people. And somebody <coughs> introduced her herself as a teacher at North Plainfield High School. That was the high school. And so I asked her, oh, so whatever happened to Joe Pecorero? And she said, well, he was teaching the adult Sunday school class here, but he's moved on to a different church now. I said, no, 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 Joe Pecorero, my persecutor from North Plainfield High School. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nine years ago, he became a Christian. And he's a wonderful Bible teacher. We love him. And he has a different opportunity at a different church. I said, whoa. 
This can't be. So anyway, I decided to call the school uh, on Monday after the, after the weekend services there. And I said, hi, Mr. Pecorero, this is John Poisty. And he said, John, we got to meet. I'd been only there one year, so it's not like everybody knew me or remembered me, but he did. And so I went down to the high school with Christine uh, the next day, or on Monday, and I can still see in my memory how he's coming down the hallway, that dreaded hallway of North Plainfield High School, with his arms stretched out. He gives me a hug, and he says, John, forgive me. That year that I had you and Norm in my class, God was dealing with me, and I took it out on you. Please forgive me. Wasn't that nice of God to let me know that, what he was doing in the background, that my suffering was worth it all of a sudden? One day, when we get to heaven, we're going to hear a lot of stories like that. And God is going to make sense of our life. Joe Pecorero became one of our supporters. For years, he was paying us to be missionaries in the world. And uh, as one of those Apostle Paul, you know, Saul to Paul conversion stories. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to let us know about that, but he chose to do so. And now I could share this story with you and hopefully encourage you that your suffering is not in vain. We don't always get these kind of answers. But uh, it helped me to understand that God is doing something behind my back, as it were. I have no idea, and I need to trust him. That doesn't make it less suffering while you're going through it or even after. It was still a traumatic year. I still remember that. But he has made sense of that trauma. And I believe that that's what God does best. And sometimes he shows off. He doesn't tell us everything he does. But when he does, listen and build an altar, as it were, in your mind. God did this. I'm going to depend on that now in the future that he's going to continue to do what he does. Okay. A little bit long for that story, but um, I wanted to share that with you. Let's keep going here. Let me read from uh, chapter 40, um, verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind again, okay, and said, dress for action like a man, just like he said before. Put on your pants. I'm going to question you, and you make it known to me. Let's talk. Let's debate. Let's discuss. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Is that what you've been doing all this time? Have you an arm Oh, don't look at me. Uh, have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. And then he talks about how he deals with, with justice in the world. Um, God is suggesting that he and Job switch places and see how that works. And that's the whole premise of you've, if you've seen Bruce Almighty. Kind of a dumb movie, but... Uh, that's, it's based on that premise. God says, okay, you take, you take charge. And of course, Bruce makes a mess of everything. Um, and I think I would make a mess of anything too, everything too. But we like to say, if I were in charge of this or that event in my life, I would have made this turn out differently. If I had been in charge in, at North Plainfield High School, I would have fired Joe Pecorero. And then the Lord wouldn't have had been able to use somehow Norm and me to be a reminder that God was after him. So we aren't in charge, thank goodness. Um, what else was I going to say here? see what we have next. 
So down deep, we all think we could do a better job than God does at times. Don't we? I would have done it differently. Um, But also, God here is not saying to Job, hey, listen, man, I'm doing my best, but this is a tough job, so don't get so upset if I don't always get it right. No, he's not a a wimpy God. He is is saying, I know the problem of evil, but I have a plan that will take care of evil once and for all. I got it covered, trust me. He had shown him the world. He had shown him how that world is ordered and both the animals and the non-animals. I got it all covered. I also know the problem of the supernatural, of evil. And I got that world covered as well. And I have a plan that's going to take care of it once and for all. Those nine years or ten years that I waited to see God work, they were long years in, 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 as far as that was concerned. But boy, were they worth waiting for. And I believe that God, just at the right time, allowed me to find out what he had been doing all that time. Um, I'm a little bit disjointed here because I am evolving in my view on some of these things here, just even as we're going through this week. So um, bear with me, okay? Um, Yeah, I think I've skipped some stuff here, but. In God's first speech, which is in 38 and 39, God was speaking to Job about his sovereign governing of his creation. Now in this second speech from from chapter 40, God is focusing on his sovereign justice over his creation, and he's emphasizing his justice by looking at the supernatural world. The first speech ends with Job holding his hand over his mouth in silence. The second speech ends or ends with Job expressing his repentance for having prejudged God and for having questioned God's justice. So each of his speeches causes Job to, re- to repent. And again, in the second speech, as I pointed out, he's speaking out of a whirlwind uh, and Both speeches have some similar elements and words at the beginning. And in the first speech, Job tells, or God tells Job, he doesn't know what he is talking about. He should be quiet. In the second speech, he says, you don't know whom you're speaking to, so be quiet. Who do you think I am, God is saying, that you would accuse me of wrong and of injustice? Job, you think you're more just than I am? Who do you think you are? But more importantly, who do you think I am? And then God answers this question in a rather unexpected way. Instead of defending himself point by point like at a trial, he tells Job, so you think you can do better? Why did you try? Give it a try. So that's why he says, dress for action. Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity in verse 10 of of chapter 40. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. In other words, do my work of justice. Go after each proud person. Bring them down to where they should be. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Go ahead. Go defeat the wicked. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I, will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. If you're able to do all that, then okay, I'll, I'll grant it to you that your arm can save you. That's pretty, pretty direct. But again, I'm, I'm maybe emphasizing too much the, the scolding here. I don't believe it's so much in scolding. It's more a conversation. Let's talk. And he's making his points now. God is. Um, God is not bullying Job here. 
He's asking him to stand up like a man, have an honest discussion with me, give it all you got, but let's play fair. Let's deal with truth. And then when you succeed in all these things where you say, I have failed, God says, I'll admit that you're better and wiser and more just than I am. We're supposed to see this as sort of a comedic, you know, uh, irony-filled discussion here. And, of course, it's always easier to laugh at Job than it would be to laugh at ourselves if we were in his place. When we are told by God, who do you think you are? Well, I am important. Well, yes, you are, but not, you're not God. So then we come to a very interesting part of the book. We come to be introduced to two strange beasts, Behemoth and Leviathan. Let me read the description of Behemoth, beginning with verse 15 of chapter 40. Behold Behemoth. In other words, look at him. You say behold when you want to... You know, you're, you're introducing somebody really, really great. Who's, who's your football team, Brett? Pro or yeah. The Vikings. the Vikings. So if the Vikings come on the field, you say, look, there are the Vikings. But if the Broncos come on the field, you say, behold, the Broncos. So you get the difference? I've made four enemies at least here. Okay. <laughs> Although right now the Broncos are... It's not even worth them showing up on the football field. <laughs> They're pretty bad right now. Sorry, you fellow Coloradans. Okay, behold behemoth, which I made as I made you. Interesting. God says that he made behemoth. Okay. He eats grass like an ox. Behold his strength that is in his loins. And his power in the muscles, oh wait a minute, behold his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. He's my prize creation. Whoa. Let him who made him Bring near his sword. I'll explain a little bit more about uh, this description as, uh, afterwards. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Under the lotus plants he lies. So somehow he's a land animal and also a, a water animal because lotus plants grow in, in ponds or rivers. In the shelter of the reeds, okay, he lies under, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade, the lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he's not frightened. He is confident, though, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? And the obvious answer is no. So this is some, some beast. Uh, what are we supposed to make of that? He's described basically as a land creature who, also, who eats grass, hides in the rivers among the reeds. What do you think just naturally this might be describing? Hippo. A hippo, okay. Uh, how many of you have tried to grab, what does he say here? Uh, take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a, a, sh a snare. Apparently, there are more deaths by hippo than any other animal in, in Africa. Um, so, dangerous. And he's the first, God seems proud. He's the first of the works of, go of God. And yet, it says in verse 19 that this mighty beast is vulnerable. Let him who made him, who made him? God. Bring near his sword. He's implying that the only one who can actually confront this beast is God himself. And it implies that the monster's creator is able to control him and even defeat him. Do you remember another instance in the Bible much later on where there's an image of a sharp sword attacking a beast? Revelation. Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation 19.
again, I'll, this is some of what I'm, I'm going to be teaching here or, or sharing with you, rather, is, is still in the process of being formed in my mind and heart and understanding. And uh, Zach, you might be interested to, to know that I'm relying on a professor from Briarcrest for some of this material. Yeah. He's from that area. It's a, Briarcrest is a Bible school, and is it also seminary? Yeah. Eric Ortland, if you ever come across him. Okay. Um, let's read from Revelation 19, beginning with verse... Well, I'm going to read... Boy. Are you guys prepared to give me a few extra minutes today? Okay. Then I saw heaven opened, verse 11, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So he's a righteous and just warrior. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Who are we talking about here? Jesus. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men. This sounds like a Marvel movie, doesn't it? Okay? Um, so on and so forth. And I saw the beast and the kings. Here we have the word beast, which is what behemoth translated means. And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, against this warrior who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived, deceived. Who deceives? Satan. Those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Could this be a fulfillment of the partial information that Job had received from God way back then? At least an interesting thought. Um, I haven't come to a final conclusion on that, but that's sort of where I'm heading. But this is a description of what we're being foretold here in Job. Okay? Um, but before we move on, as we go back to the first chapters of Job, who were, who were the original cast of characters? Who appeared in the first couple chapters? Okay, we had the angels, God. God, the Satan, Job and his family. Okay, that was the basic cast of characters. We haven't heard anything about the Satan since then, have we? He hasn't been mentioned. He played such an important part, and then all of a sudden, nothing. What's happened to him? Okay, could it be that these two fearsome beasts, Behemoth and Leviathan, are reappearing here as reminders of the power and influence of evil that we saw at the beginning of the story? A reminder of the Satan. Is Leviathan the Satan? Is he supposed to, or is Leviathan supposed to represent the Satan? I don't know. I can't say that with you know, authority because it doesn't say so. But it certainly seems that these two fearsome beasts have some type of supernatural origin to them. Did, who made the angels? 
Who created the angels? Who created the Satan? God. Yeah. So here, this terrific, you know, the fearful beast, it says that God made him, and he was the height of his creation, which would also indicate perhaps some high up supernatural <laughs> creature, such as the Satan. Um, so God is pointing out that there's not just the danger and the chaos and the predators in the natural world, there's also danger and chaos and evil in the supernatural world. And it seems like, from what God is saying here, that that's just part of his creation. That's the way he has created the world, to include that, which is interesting to me. Um, so, we have behemoth. Some of this is repetitive here. Okay. Then we have Leviathan, starting in chapter 41, and a whole chapter on Leviathan. And then that's basically it for what God, God has to say. I mean, what a way to end a book on suffering with a description of yet another animal. It seems to be another animal. Um, okay, let's read for verse, from verse 1 of 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw? And again, the implication is that God can do this. But he's saying to Job, can you do this? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Is he going to be able to be tamed? Will you play with him as with a bird or will you put him on a leash for your your girls? Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? I, these are all rhetorical questions. The answer is no, 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 no in all of these, okay? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle and you will not do it again. You touch him, you know, you'll remember that. You're not going to ever do that again. And so he continues with this uh, description. And as you read the description, you're just like you were prompted to think of a hippo in the first one, you're prompted to think of a crocodile here. And most commentators that I've read, they will say that these are cartoonish, poetic descriptions of a hippo and a crocodile. But somehow that explanation just is not very satisfying to me. Um, do you think that Job was really comforted to learn that God could control and tame a hippo and a crocodile? And so based on that, hey, everything's fine with all this stuff that's happened to me because God can tame these two animals that I can see in a zoo. Really? That doesn't sound to me like that's a good enough explanation that God, Job is going to let God off the hook. Oh, you can tame a hippo. Oh, now I can trust you. Uh, now it makes sense why I had to go through all of this, you know, this uh, suffering and everything. That explains why I lost all my kids. Mm, I don't get that. I don't, I don't think that. Um, it doesn't seem like he's trying to comfort Job at all. He's I think he is. Prove the point. I think he is. But by proving that point, I believe it's comforting Job because of his response. Other commentators theori theorize that Behemoth and Leviathan were dinosaurs that died out many eons ago. I don't buy that either. Um, then there are other commentators who say that Behemoth and Leviathan are the equivalent of mythical characters um, in our modern day movies or cartoons like Monsters, Inc. or Lion King or or rodents of unusual size from Princess Bride. In other words, they're just symbols of the dangers and chaos that we can imagine. But then why does God say that he created them? You know, he's not Steven Spielberg drawing cartoon characters for us to see on a screen. These are actual beings of some sort. 
Another theory is he's just referring to the mythical monsters of ancient stories. And there were stories about Leviathan and Behemoth was also mentioned in some of these myths uh, and their mythical characters. Um, and I believe he's using that because these were the, the worst monsters in myth mythology of the day that they could imagine. But he's using them as examples and assigning them as representative of something greater than even those mythical, um, mythical characters. And he's assigning them that they are evil and yet under his control. Um, it's, it's very interesting in chapter 41, if you go to verse 12, um, and through the end of the chapter, really, he's, he's praising Leviathan sort of as a worthy opponent. This, this is, you know, <coughs> this is not just a Viking. This is, this is a Bronco, you know. Um, so I believe the conclusion I've drawn here is that these creatures, monsters, behemoth and Leviathan, I believe symbolize Satan and his demons. They were created by God. They can only be controlled by God. Satan was a created being, the highest of the angels. He rebelled against God, continues to create chaos wherever he goes. And to me, it fits the description. So he's talking symbolically about the evil forces of the supernatural world. Whether it's exactly Satan, that seems the most logical, but I can't tell you for sure. Um, if it was betraying that, why wouldn't he just pick one creature? I don't know. Maybe he's using both of them to describe Satan together. I don't know. It, it doesn't say. But Leviathan is the one that is mentioned most often in the Bible. And I'm not sure that behemoth in this kind of a context is mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. Um, so I believe the point God is making here is that there is a source of unimaginable evil that has been affecting you, Job, and has been attacking you. So here you thought it was just your friends. You thought it was just a, uh, a natural occurrence and that there was injustice here on this world. But there's another dimension that you don't know anything about. And I am going to describe that a little bit to you and reassure you that I have control of that as well. I am in control of the supernatural world. I'm going to take my few minutes that you gave me here. Um, so some of the options of who they are would be actual animals, hippo and crocodile. I, I admit the majority of commentators adopt that view. I used to sort of adopt that, but it wasn't satisfactory, and now I don't anymore. So take that for what it's worth. Others would say mythical animals from the folk stories of the day, um, and then extinct family, uh, extinct animals like dinosaurs. If you've never seen a rodent of unusual size, that's what it looks like. Okay. If you are Princess Bride fans. Um, in the beginning of chapter 41, God asks a question. And again, it's a rhetorical question. He says, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? And he, God is implying here that I can do that. I can capture Leviathan, and I can defeat Leviathan, even though you can't. Um, it's similar to God's promise about another slithery monster. In Genesis chapter 3, who do we have there? The serpent. The serpent, like Leviathan and Behemoth, representing Satan. He's identified later as Satan, but he appears as an animal. An animal that we are, at least most of us who are sane, are quite afraid of. Um, some of you have them probably as pets. You're insane. And God promised 
way back in Genesis 3 to send a monster slayer who would crush the head of the snake. Do you remember that? Oh, boy. Anyway, I, I'm going to have to go back for some of these later. Um, Genesis 3, 15. Somebody is going to come through Adam and Eve one day to crush the head of that monster. So the whole monster, slithery snake, animal, compared to supernatural powers, started already way back in Genesis chapter 3. And so that makes sense to me that that is what, jo uh, what God is telling Job about here in, um, in this. So he's taking mythical characters from their culture and using them to represent supernatural beings that perpetuate evil and rebellion and chaos. And he's reassuring Job, that is really what was behind all of this. It was not you having done something wrong. It was this evil that I have allowed to, to exist in my world because somehow that brings glory to God and accomplishes his purposes. So we don't have any clean, tidy answer, but God is saying this is what it is. And one day, I'm going to take care of that. And that rebellion will be over. Okay? That's my best attempt at trying to explain Behemoth and Leviathan in a very brief time. And I'm sure there will be questions, but we'll, can we save those until tomorrow morning? Write them down if you have questions. And um, I know two of these guys here have have some theories also, and I'd like to hear how much this meshes with what you guys have discovered, and I'd like to hear your, your input to that as well. So tomorrow we're going to wrap this up. We're going to do a little bit of just what kind of lessons can we learn from Job practically now as we you know, sum it all up, and I will take any questions you have. I'll take them. I don't, I'm sure, not sure I'll be able to answer them and any comments and discussion that we want to have tomorrow. Okay, we're going to make it to the end of the book. We're almost there. Okay, thank you guys. Have a great supper, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning.